morning. We're going to simply sing that simple song, a little chorus. I'll say yes, yes, yes. You prepare your hearts this morning to say yes to the word. All we can do is believe it. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll say yes, yes, yes. I'll say yes, yes, yes. I'll say yes, Lord. I'll And we truly appreciate the Lord's hand in these matters. Wanted to just connect with some of the things we were dealing with last week. Um, and you'll notice from the scripture here, Exodus 25, 31, Thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. And uh, just by way of revision, as we're reading along, notice, as we said last week, the botanical uh, aspects to this. It's speaking about its bulbs, its flowers, its branches, all these things. It's the things that you would find on a tree in the natural he says, and six branches shall come out of the side of it, three branches on the can of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds, with a knob and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch. 
with a knob and a flower so in the six branches that come out of the candlestick and in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knobs and their flowers and there shall be a knob under two branches of the same and a knob under two branches of the same and a knob under two branches of the same according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick their knobs and their branches shall be of the same it shall be one beaten work of pure gold and thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof and they shall light the lamps thereof that they may give light over against it and the tongues thereof and the snuff dishes thereof shall be of pure gold of a talent of pure gold shall he make it with all these vessels and look that thou make them after their pattern which was showed thee in the mount may the lord bless the reading of his word let's just bow in prayer gracious heavenly father we're just so grateful for this privilege that we have this morning to be once again gathered together in your house lord and we just confess this morning that all we have that is of any value is what you put into our lives and we want to bring our adoration and our praise to you lord what would we be without you we recognize this morning lord that while we were yet sinners you loved us and lord even though we have made mistakes and we've disappointed you you have forgiven you have shown a grace beyond measure and we are so grateful for that this morning and we just want to ask by your kind mercy and grace that you'll be in our midst blessing the hearts of your sons and daughters as they've gathered today around your precious word here in this place lord and in their homes where they're connected via the internet lord we know your holy spirit is able to bring the true blessing of the word the insight in your word may you touch every heart lord hide the speaker away and lord may you anoint your word to our hearts and to our ears this morning we pray in the name of jesus christ amen you can be seated <clears throat> So last Sunday morning, we did um, quite a bit more of an exposition on the actual physical makeup of this candlestick or uh, lampstand, which is probably the better translation. Uh, in the original, the term is menorah, which many of you may have heard of uh, because it's the term that is used by the Jewish faith. and. Uh, but the reality is, is that looking at all the things that go into this candlestick, it makes us realize just what a, a complex uh, part of the furniture this was. And uh, none of the other uh, instruments, vessels, nothing was as complex to make as the candlestick. And then we recognize from the scriptures that we went into, and we'll touch on some of them again this morning, that this pertains particularly uh, to us here at the end time. We see the interpretation of the candlestick of Revelations 1 showing forth that those lamps are really uh, the light for each church age and how that that really spread across the gentile dispensation coming from ephesus to laodicea and uh, we touched on many of those things i'd like to emphasize one or two points this morning as we start on this from exodus the scripture saying that this must be of one piece and this is where it really as we said last week the whole manufacture of it had to have some supernatural element to it some kind of guidance by god because how do you take one solid piece of gold and make the kind of candlestick out of it with the intricacies the branches the the spaces for the oil to flow all those things uh, out of one piece not breaking it having it completely functional and it's very complex and i think when you really look at that it has been a great and tremendous and supernatural task to bring forth a church that we see that has been brought with all its intricacies and and what it represents 
and the fact that it had to be functional. And I believe as it represents the Gentile church and that dispensation <coughs> on the whole, Excuse me, this morning we recognize that that church is, is made up in a way that seemed impossible and seems unlikely for the world to ever recognize. But by God's grace we see that he has brought it and because it's one source, one piece of gold, it really shows us that there is one body. It speaks of the body of Christ. It speaks of deity. We know gold uh, in Scripture symbolically always speaks of deity. And what is it? It's coming from one God, not something that's split up. It's not a lot of different churches and the different ideas that somebody starts to pull together and say, let's be one. No, it's coming from one source. That is the, where the real unity of the bride exists. And that's what I believe we see under Ephesians 4, the Scripture shows us that that uh, body will once again stand till we all come the scripture says in the unity of the faith till we are all one and what is it because our connection with deity with the word that's where our oneness lays <coughs> excuse me we touched a little bit on the fact that this was of beaten work which really says that they used uh, instruments to hammer, to, to chisel away, to work. This was not something that was poured in, in some uh, kind of furnace where they had made a mold and, and just poured this into it. No, it's not a poured work. It's, it's, it's not molten or cast in that way. But it had to be a beaten work. And there's something in that this morning that I would like to mention. And as I said last time, that this term beaten uh, referred in the original to the fact that it is a difficult work. It is not an easy thing to accomplish. But you know, if you had to have had a cost and uh, they took the gold, well, they could have melted the one piece of gold and they could have poured it into this cast and you would have had it still as one piece, maybe theoretically. But the reality is, if you did that, tomorrow somebody can come and take the same cast and cast another one and another one and just make duplicates of the same. But not when it's something that's a beaten work. It's like any art that is actually done by the hands of the artisan. Uh, he, he works, he chips away, he cuts away, he, he hammers, he, he, he's working with his instruments. And because it is a beaten work, it means that there is only one of its kind. You can make something that will closely resemble it, but it can never be that one because you made one that was the original one. And that original one was of beaten work. There is no mold to just replicate it. And I, I just love that because that speaks about our own personal walk as believers. You know, God doesn't just pour us out in molds. Here's another Christian. Here's another son of God. No, every one of us, he has, he has worked with us. He has beaten us. I trust you know that because the scripture says every true son goes through chastisement and those things. Why? Because there's a shaping necessary. It's done uh, by the hand of God and, and by his workmanship in our lives. We recognize that this now is bringing forth an original something that is unique. The body of Christ. You cannot just make another. You cannot just start another church. It's got to be part of the same. It's got to be one. There, there is no duplication of this. We recognize that this is a very important thing. Uh, also with the beating. You know, when the goldsmith beats that, and I'm sure we've many times listened to it, how that they did in the old times. Uh, they would take that piece of gold and they would beat it and beat it and beat it. Because many times the way they would find that gold, uh, whether it be alluvial gold or whether they had to take it out of the ground, it wasn't in its pure state. There was impurities in it. There was things that needed to be got rid of. And how did they do that? They kept beating it and beating it and beating it. And all of those impurities couldn't stand the constant hammering, couldn't stand the beating. And the impurities break up and come off. And, and, but the gold remains and the gold gets tighter and tighter and, and harder and smoother and, and starts to have a, a gloss to it. It starts to, to really shine forth its beauty and all the impurities are taken away. 
Uh, they say that uh, jewelry that is actually handmade like that compared to jewelry that is cast or poured, uh, as always the handmade has got a better shine to it because of that constant beating process. My, and should we ever compare the ease of pouring something to the ease or to the difficulty rather of having to make it out of beaten work. I want us to recognize that the Lord doesn't say, well, just take the easy way out. No, He's got a specific way that He wants it. And it may not be the easiest way, but it is the best way. Amen. So we trust this morning, as we look at this a little further, we can just see ourselves in this picture. I uh, have neglected probably to say my title this morning. I want to title the message, The Wild Olive. And for that, if we can turn in our Bibles to Zechariah chapter 4. <coughs> Excuse me. Zechariah chapter 4. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. Uh, a lot of our thoughts is, this morning is going to come from this chapter. So I don't want to just rush through it. I want to just draw our attention to the first thing that is spoken about here is the angel that is guiding this prophet through this process. These visions that are coming was not for carnal interpretation. But God has a messenger, as Job speaks about it in Job 33, an interpreter that is standing by. Because many things that are there in symbolics and things that God shows us in His Word are not easy to understand. And you know, the quicker we recognize our own ignorance concerning the matter and confess our ignorance, the quicker we can be helped. So here is an angel that is helping this prophet along. The angel that he says that's been talking with me. And if you read the other parts, the previous chapters, you'll notice there's an angel that's showing him, taking him through different visions and interpreting the visions to him. He says he came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep. And I think this is very beautiful because this says that this is an awakening time. It is now coming into a quickening that is taking place. There's actually a, a, a view of the restoration of the things that should come. Because remember, Zechariah was written at the time of the restoration of the kingdom. Uh, restoration of the temple. The restoration of Jerusalem. Now he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold with a bowl on top, the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and the seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. And I think this is where we see a beautiful picture, because when he describes it, it is not so clearly spoken in, in uh, Exodus 25, but he shows that those branches that are going up are doing exactly what a branch does in a tree. It has got a way to take moisture from a lower point and bring it up to the higher point. That is exactly what these are now spoken of as not branches, but he calls them pipes. Amen. For the oil to be able to move from a central source into all of the lamps. It is a beautiful picture. Listen, he says, <laughs> seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof. Now it is, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. Now, <coughs> pardon me. I think we need to just notice, when Moses speaks about the candlestick, he does not speak about anything else that is noticed around the candlestick. The Old Testament was relying on the priests to bring the oil, was relying on the priests to trim the lamps, was relying on the Aaronic priest to, to intervene 
in what we see now here in this vision is done by a different process. There's two olive trees. He doesn't mention them in Exodus. When you go over to Revelation, and we will in a moment, I want you to notice when John sees the candlestick, he doesn't see the Aaronic priesthood, nor does he see two olive trees, but the scripture says he sees one like unto the Son of Man, moving in the midst. And I think it is important for us to look at these symbolics and to see what is it saying, what is it meaning to us. Let's just read a little further here. He says, And two olive trees by it, one on the right, upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. And I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And I want you to notice, uh, right when he sees this, this is something he, he may have been familiar with the idea of the candlestick, but this is the first time he's seeing it connected with two olive trees. And then he says, what are these? What are these? What is it? Amen. Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And I want you to recognize this morning, as I said earlier, he doesn't come along and say, well, you know, I'm the prophet of the age. Uh, I'm receiving things directly from God. I know all about this. No, he says, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I need some help. I need some instruction. I need some interpretation. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Now remember, Zerubbabel is the one who's rebuilding the temple. From foundation to headstone. Amen. Saying not by might. Nor by power. And I looked at those words in the original. It really shows it is not by any kind of force that you can exert. It is not by any power that you can uh, bring this to pass. But by my spirit. And you'll notice the emphasis here has been on the oil. Now we see he's showing you that it is not a material thing, but there is a spiritual thing. It's the spirit, it's the anointing that is important. This is how this is going to be done, say the Lord of hosts. As Zechariah speaks, he is speaking particularly about the situation in his time where uh, we realize that Nehemiah and Ezra are involved with this restoration of the temple in Jerusalem, rebuilding the ruins. Uh, Zerubbabel appointed specifically Joshua, the priest, standing by him. Uh, and you see Zerubbabel really as a political head. And, and you see uh, Joshua as a spiritual head working together to build back what was destroyed through disobedience. When Israel went and the Jewish nation went after after idolatry. They lost that and it was destroyed. But now it is being rebuilt. And he's speaking particularly about the process there. But being that it is prophetic words, we realize that it does not just have a singular interpretation for the time or the season, but that that which is in the Old Testament is a shadow and a type of that which will come in the New Testament. So we're talking not just about the construction of an Old Testament temple that is being restored, but we're talking about the building of the church in the New Testament. And he's saying, it's not going to come through your strength. It's not going to come through your abilities or your powers or your might, but it's going to come by the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit that is needed in every age. Amen. Who art thou, O great mountain, he then says, before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. And here this morning, I think it's a time of rejoicing for the church. Because Zerubbabel now, he's the one who laid the foundation. We'll read that in a minute here. He lays the foundation, but there is an unsurmountable uh, obstacle in his way. 
There is, uh, amongst his own people, there are those who don't want to see the rebuilding. There is the heathen nations, many of those who are loyal to foreign gods, they didn't want to see it rebuilt. You read the story about the restoration, we spoke about it some months back, and they were building literally with a sword in one hand and the building implements in the other. It was a tremendous battle. So it is when the church started out. You know, the church hadn't even got its first bit going when there was people being martyred for the faith. The opposition was great and high. Satan was against it right from the very start. But who are you, great mountain before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. The Lord will make a way. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof. That's really the final stone, the capping stone. It is speaking really of that final placing of Christ in his position as the head of it all in the church. He shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. Now this is the restoration process. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? And I want to just bring in this principle. You watch this tremendous work. But it's God in simplicity. It's little things that God does that finally achieves that result. Who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. Now notice he's got Zerubbabel here, which in this is signifying the ministry of Christ. He's got the plummet. That is really showing what is the right way to build, putting the standard there. And he says, the plummet in his hand with those seven. Now you remember when we read about him in Revelation 10, uh, sorry, Revelation 1. There is the one like unto the Son of Man. In his hand he has the seven. The seven stars. Amen. Now he says, See the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel? With those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. I want to just say, you see the plummet and the stars are all in his hand. The plummet is really what brings you, as we said, that's what will make you make the building correctly stand uh, it's got to be upright. It's got to be perfectly perpendicular. All those things. You're using the plummet to check those things. How does he do that? He's got a messenger for every age that's going to bring. When people start leaning a little bit towards the world this way, there comes that messenger, pulls the thing straight up again. They go a little bit over to fanaticism on this side, comes the messenger, pulls them right back again. All the time, making sure that the thing stays perpendicular, that it stays in the proper fashion that it was supposed to be done. Then answered I and said unto him, because you haven't answered my question, angel. Because <laughs> I asked you, what are these? You're telling me all about the building process and all the things around it. But I want to know about these olive trees. What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I want you to notice that the angel does not give them names does not directly answer the question, but again puts a kind of symbolic into it. Because the time for knowing all of those things probably was not yet. We realize at the time there were two great ones standing before the Lord to do the work. There was Zerubbabel and Joshua. He could have said, well, it's Zerubbabel and Joshua. And maybe in type it was showing to that. But listen what he says. Who are these? 
What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive tree branches which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Hmm. Just leaves it a bit open. Specifically, when you recognize that they only had the Old Testament reference. I, I, I try to look back and, and I didn't find any place where the term two anointed ones is used exactly like that anywhere preceding this. It is, and you can think of it, used in Revelation chapter 11. But it's not used before that. But here it is stated, these are the two anointed ones. Now, just before we go into that, because I know I'm going to miss this point if I move on. He says, these empty themselves. And I think that's so beautiful because you, 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 you're seeing something of these two trees that are growing beside. Two olive trees. That's the kind of oil that they burnt in the candlestick. Amen. Pure olive oil. This tree has the inbuilt ability to stand in the ground by its genetic code that was in its seed. It can put its roots into the ground, find the minerals and everything to make the branches grow, and then it can take the water, which is a type of the word, and it can bring from that another kind of liquid and the water would come up through its branches, through its pipes, but as it is going into the fruit, it becomes an oily substance, which they later in the manufacturing process would uh, reap the fruits, put it into uh, a vat, and, and they would break it down and trade it down. A wine, like a wine press, you'd have an oil press where literally the fruit is broken up. The oil would separate from all the other substances. And as you know, oil would float on top and they would be able to separate that, filter it. And finally, that pure oil would be brought back and burnt in this candlestick. But God bypasses the process of man's intervention in the manufacturing process. And he has the tree itself growing up and in some way connecting up with this. That automatically it's pouring it from the tree into the lampstand. Feeding it through the pipes. It's a beautiful principle. But I want you to notice that whatever is bringing the branches, whatever, it's, it's, it's a ministry that is bringing it from the word to the anointing. There's a supernatural work that is taking place. And as it is flowing forth from that condition, it comes to that final point. And what does he say? He doesn't hold back, but he empties it out. And he pours it out. Whatever is available gets put into the candlestick. It's poured into the church. And I think that's such a beautiful type of how Christ doesn't hold back nothing from us. But whatever he's putting into it, he's, he's letting it come right through and pours it out. He emptied himself for us. Poured it in. Amen. My. Thus we also see here the principle that this anointing oil comes from the same source. It is coming through the branches, but it's not seven different kinds of oil, seven different kinds of anointing for every age, but it's actually the same thing all along. Now, looking at these two olive trees, <clears throat> excuse me, it's fed by these two olive trees. And I want you to notice the prophet, when he sees the candlestick, he goes right to describe the two olive trees. And he said, what be these? That's plural. So he's not asking what is this, the candlestick, but he's asking what be these? He wants to know more than just the candlesticks because he's seen two olive trees. 
Then he comes back and he asks him again about the candles, about the olive trees. What are they? And he still doesn't get his answer. A third time he says, what is it? And he gets the answer. These are the two anointed ones that stand before the Lord. By the Lord of the whole earth. Amen. Uh, if I can just make this very clear. When we look at these olive trees, it's symbolic of something very beautiful. And you can take different scriptures, and you can take different quotations, and you can actually say, it's this. And you'd be right. And somebody else can come along and say, it's that. And they'd also be right. Let me just look for a moment at this olive tree. What it produces at the end, the product in the olives is an oil that burns in God's candlestick. When I look at that, my mind has to go back to the days when Moses was herding the sheep in the backside of the desert. And he saw a picture that is such a strange thing to him. And like the prophet here says, what is this? Moses sees a bush. Amen. That is a plant with branches coming up through leaves, maybe bulbs, fruits. And it's standing there and it's burning, but it is not consumed. He says, I will turn aside to see this. Why? Because something in him was inquiring to know what this is. And when he came to it, he found the bush was burning. But he never comes to describe to us the detail of the bush. Because the moment he comes in close proximity to this burning, there's a voice speaking to him from the bush. I, uh, can I say it this morning? The occupant, it wasn't the bush speaking, but there was an occupant in the bush. The source of the fire was in the bush. And he said, don't step nearer. First take the shoes off your feet. Because the place you're standing is holy ground. And he starts to instruct him. He says to him, who are you, Lord? Who are you sending? Who, who can I say is sending me? He's talking to something in this bush. He says, just tell them the I am sent you. Who was in the bush? It was God. Where did the source of the fire come from? It was God. And I think we must remember this wherever you want to interpret this. That ultimately it comes back. The candlestick is of gold. That which is feeding into this is none other than the Spirit of God. By a supernatural way coming into a church that He has shaped and molded for Himself. I'll read you some statements here in a minute. But I want to just say this. Who are these? These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of all the earth. This is the answer he got. Brother Brown makes a statement. He says, Old Testament and New Testament. Amen. Jews and Gentiles. Amen. As I said earlier, you can look at Zerubbabel and Joshua. If you, if you went to Revelations 11... And I'd like us to do that for a moment. We can do that. You can keep your hand at Zechariah if you want to refer back to the scriptures there as we go along. But Revelations chapter 11, verse 3. He says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's three and a half years. That's their ministry. Clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees. And the two candlesticks. Standing before the God of the earth. Well he refers to them not only as two olive trees but two candlesticks. 
my thoughts did go on to this at some point. You know, as, as Gentiles now, we interpret the temple and the instruments in the light of the revelation of Jesus Christ, of what we have seen. And in the light of the mysteries of God being revealed here at the end time. And therefore we know when we come to the candlestick, well that church speaks of the seven church ages. We see that. So to us, it represents the Gentiles. But what was it to Israel? It also had to represent something to them. Because for them, it was there in their types and in their symbols. It had to also hold something for them. But the reality was, in their day, they only saw the symbol and they never understood the meanings. They saw the sacrifices but never realized that this was the Messiah. They saw the ark. Well, not the common person, but they knew it was there. Made of shittim wood and overlaid with gold. But they didn't know what the wood represented and what the gold represented. These were things that would later come to light. Maybe I should just at this point take the portion here. Message the seven church ages. Brother Brown preached in 1954. This is before he ever got to preaching the church ages in sequence, as we know from uh, Patmos vision, revelation of Jesus Christ, through the different messages that make up finally the context for this church age book. He preached one message, the seven church ages. And he says this in there. He says, the seven golden candlesticks, they had little lamps on top of them that burnt oil. Over in Zechariah, where he saw the vision, I believe it was, and he saw the wild olive tree and the tame olive tree. Now watch how God, in the progression, progressive revelation of the word, brings us now to understand it's not just two olive trees, but they're, they're slightly different. The one is wild and the other one is tame. As it's spoken here. Listen, he says, he saw the wild olive tree and the tame olive tree, the Jew and the Gentile. Way before the dispensation of Gentile. They had a golden censers and put both of these golden censers run into this one candlestick here that furnished oil for all the lamps. And he couldn't understand how thing, these things was. The wild olive tree and the tame olive tree. Right? And I want to just to say this. He says, And the tame olive tree, of course, was broke off. Now you see, Zechariah doesn't speak of that. But that's the reality. Is that they were first there. The tame olive tree. They were connected to the candlestick. But... They turned away from the true living God and followed idols. And what did he do? He broke them off. Listen to how he says it here. He says, and the tame olive tree, of course, was broke off and the wild olive tree grafted into it. Amen. That's why I wanted to say this morning, look at that wild olive tree, because that's where you and I got a chance. The amazing thing to me as I looked at the subject this, for this morning is that no matter where in the scripture you go, you read the message of God's grace to us the Gentiles. Because actually we had no part in this when you looked at the original symbolics. When you look at what Moses laid out there and, and how it was and their menorah in, in the tabernacle, we had no view into that. We weren't even allowed in the outer court. Just dogs out there. Don't come near this holy place. But God, when they disappointed him and he turned his back on them, said, I'm turning. And from a people that were not called my people, a people that were not a people, 
I bring out of that somebody for my namesake. And he took us and he, he connected us. And that's why I see this uh, image that John is describing. Two candlesticks. One speaking of an Old Testament church. One speaking of a New Testament church. Anointed. In its season. Amen. You look at what Brother Bram says. Old Testament, New Testament. You, you look at those things. You realize that's the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. He's the source of that oil, of that burning. He's, he's the one. But he had an anointed word which was the Old Testament. And he has an anointed word which is the New Testament. <coughs> Excuse me. And what is so striking is that when Zechariah is speaking about the restoration of the temple of God, he is actually speaking about both things feeding in, which really tells you that the New Testament church is not just going to quote New Testament scriptures, but they're going to draw the anointing from old and new to bring forth the perfect body that Christ would dwell in and cap off himself. Notice... <coughs> And the tame olive tree, of course, was broke off, and the wild olive tree crafted into it. And that oil to the lamp, oil represents the Holy Spirit always. We'll get in that on the marking of the people Friday night notice. But this oil represents the Holy Spirit. That's why we anoint the sick with oil, is because it represents the Holy Spirit. The Bible said in Revelation the sixth chapter, when the plague went through, he said, A measure of wheat for a penny and two measures of barley for a penny, but don't hurt my oil and my, sorry, my wine and my oil. Wish we was going to take Revelation on through for a few weeks and get into that who, notice what term he uses, not what, who that wine and oil is. Well, he's told us the oil is the Holy Spirit. So the wine must be a person too. Amen. The one is the anointing. The one is the revelation. And when you really want to know who is the wine, that is none other than the revealed Christ. He is the revelation that you have to have. So not a revelation about what's going on here or going on there. It's the personal revelation of Jesus Christ that brings you into relationship with Him. And Brother Branham goes on to describe the lighting of the, the candlesticks. And he finally comes to this and he says it comes from the fire that God started. And that's why I go back to what Moses saw there. In a burning bush, the ends of it burning along. God started the fire. He is the one. He's the one that consumed the sacrifices. He's the one that starts the fire. Now, clearly, when we read Revelations 11, he says these are the two olive trees. So he, in Revelation, is connecting this back with Zechariah. And he talks about two witnesses. Well, when you look at those two witnesses, they have a ministry. I'm going to read it for you just for a moment. These are the two olive trees, the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. If any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. You notice here they have this fire coming out of their mouth. Amen. It is the anointed ones before the Lord. There's an anointing, Holy Spirit, licks of fire coming out. Listen, he says, fire proceedeth out of their mouths and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And that's exactly what Elijah did in his day. That's the ministry he demonstrated. And have power over waters to turn them to blood. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Well, that we saw with Moses. 
And that's why we understand that this is really Moses and Elijah coming, not in a prophetic role, but he says they're coming as witnesses. Just before I touch another point here, if I can just take you back to the original there. It's, it's so beautiful sometimes when you see that. We read in the English, the two anointed ones. That's what Zechariah wrote. But what did he really write? He wrote, these are the two sons of oil that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Because the oil speaks of the anointing. So when we translated the King James, they just took it further from oil to say, okay, well, that depicts the anointing. And just simply, instead of sons, they put down ones, the anointed ones. But the word in the original is bane, which means a son. He who bears the family banner and builds the family name. The two sons of oil. And it's so beautiful when you start looking at that then, the Jew and the Gentiles. It's two anointed genealogies. The one speaking of a natural seed and the other speaking of a spiritual seed. Amen. But the Lord said about Israel, the natural seed, He said, tell Pharaoh, this is my son. You're oppressing my son. When we come to the New Testament church, what is that? It's coming from the true Son, which is Christ Himself, Jesus Christ, who starts the church, who is the foundation stone and the headstone, and is the life in between all of that. Amen? <coughs> this term there for oil, the two sons of oil, the root is, is for oil is from something to glisten, uh, and, and it comes from a root source, which means to press out the oil. The sun, when we say sun, uh, sun is something that is birthed from something. That will, because it is birthed from somewhere, it carries the characteristics of that. Often you will find, and even in Scripture, the term, people will talk about something as the sons of that. Remember the Scripture speaks of the sons of the prophets. It doesn't mean that all of their fathers were prophets. But it means that they were carrying the characteristics of prophets in them. The scripture speaks of the sons of Belial. And you know exactly what he's saying. He's not saying they're directly descendants of Satan. But he says they are characterizing certain behavior patterns. Amen. We are called in the New Testament the children of the light. That doesn't mean that you were literally born from a light. But it means that you carry the characteristics of the light. So when we talk about the sons of oil, we're saying that these are carrying the characteristics of the oil. They have the characteristics of the anointing upon them. That is bringing forth something that brings deliverance. Now as we saw here in Revelations now, he's taking it and he's showing us Moses and Elijah, two witnesses. These are my two witnesses. The two olive trees, two witnesses. Well, if I, if I may just for a moment say that you see, we're, we're actually, we haven't seen it denoted like that. When, when, when Zechariah talks about it, he just says, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. When we come to the end time, we come to the time of full revelation. But we also realize that when that revelation comes, then God removes any form of excuse from man. We step right over into a judgment season. So that when you see Christ depicted in the book of Revelation, His feet are as feet of brass. The mighty angel that comes down from heaven in Revelation 10 has feet of brass. That speaks of judgment. And we realize he's coming to judge all those who would not believe his anointed ones. 
But God had a law. Before you can find this final judgment, God always honors His own word. Deuteronomy 17 verse 6, and I'm just going to read it, just jot it down if you like to check it at home. At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, shall, he shall not be put to death. The Lord says, before this destruction comes, I want two witnesses. I want two witnesses. Before doom comes upon mankind, I want two witnesses. The Lord is very particular about this. Later on, Deuteronomy 19.15, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, or for any sin, in any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall, be, shall the matter be established. When Jesus comes in the New Testament, in Matthew 18, 16, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that at the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And they even applied that when they wanted to put Jesus to death. Scripture says many false witnesses came, but they could not agree. So one would come and say, he did this, and somebody else comes and says, no, no, he was doing that. Somebody else says, no, no, he was doing that. Finally, they got two sons of Belial, false witnesses, that came and said the same thing. That sets the scene for death, the punishment to be implemented. The scripture goes on further. Even Paul, when he speaks to the Corinthians, he talks about his various trips to them. He says, I'm coming again to you, that by two or three witnesses, the thing can be established. Paul speaks about it in Hebrews 10, 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So the Lord says, before this actual banishment comes, and the earth is destroyed, and all that lives upon it, there's going to be two witnesses. Final witnessing before the total destruction and annihilation of what lays there. God is faithful. Amen. So now we notice that these things speak of Moses. It speaks of Elijah. Amen. And I think it's just so important uh, that we recognize then in God's law, there was a requirement for two witnesses before the judgment if it is something that is worthy of death. Amen. That's separation. So the interpreting angel, as we said now, he specifically avoids placing names and saying this is Joshua and Zerubbabel or, or this is Moses and Elijah. Why? Because there is a wide application of these two olive trees, as we see. It is the Jews and the Gentiles. It speaks of those things, depicts that. It speaks of Old Testament and New Testament. I'm just going to read you this little portion here from uh, the message Patmos Vision. Brother Branham says this, and two olive trees by it. What did they burn in those lamps in the Bible? Time, does anyone know? Oil. What kind of oil? Olive oil. Two olive trees. What is it? The New and Old Testament. It's two standing by it. Amen. What is that? That's two witnesses. That's what it is. They stand there as a witness. I want us to see this because in Revelation now he says these two olive trees, these are my two witnesses. Now you see how correct this is for the prophet to say it's Old Testament and New Testament. Because God has a standard of judgment. And what does he do? He says, call my witnesses. Is it there? Did I tell you about it? Is it there? Did I tell you about it? There's no way of escape because he brings both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, anyone who lived in that day, there was the Word of God was there. It was established. It could be accessed. But what did they do? They rejected the Word of God. They'll pay for that. Here in the New Testament, what do we have? We have the Word of God. But what do people do? They neglect it. They reject it. 
Oh, that was written for another day, for another application. What is it? Those two things will stand as witnesses against every sinner who would not repent at the word of God. Then you have the Jew and the Gentile, or if we may, Israel and the church. All through the Old Testament, there was Israel. It was God's testimony. It's God's witness of the hour. What was it doing? Nations around could come to it and see, here's a people that fellowship, that worship around a tabernacle. God himself comes and dwells in this place. They could learn and they could read the laws. They could understand the things that were given. And you know the scripture allows for proselytes, as they were called. That means people who actually converted to the faith, been made part of the movement of Israel because they moved away from where they were and became part of that. Everyone who did not do that has the Israel nation, Israeli nation as a witness against them on that day. When you come to the New Testament, God has always had a church. No matter how dark the ages came, God always had somebody that was the anointed for the age. There was always a little light burning somewhere. See, I want you to notice that God uses the witness. Because when you find Christ in Revelation 1, John says, I turned to see the voice that spoke because he says, I heard behind me the voice as of a trumpet. And I turned to see the voice. I saw seven golden candlesticks. What was it? He saw the church right there from Ephesus to Laodicea. Amen. And in the midst of that, I saw one like unto the Son of Man. Amen. He's the ultimate source of the anointing. He's the ultimate source of the oil. He's the ultimate source of the words. He's the ultimate source of the utterance. But he has in his hand seven stars, which are the messengers that is reflecting the voice of God through their ministry out to the people. And then you have the people who receive that, that hear the voice of the messenger, that take that same message and spread it further and further and further abroad. There's your witness. The voices crying out against sin. You see, by the fact that the angel does not place names, he's allowing us to get to the understanding that a single application of the scripture would not allow for us to see the fullness of what that symbolic representation was all about. We have to remember, and as you read Zechariah, that the text in Zechariah specifically tasks itself with the revelation of the restoration of the church. Building back what was lost. Therefore, we must see the present day application of these things. When you look at these things... Um, in the Old Testament, symbolic, you have two olive trees. As we many times found in, in Scripture, symbols needed to be multiplied. How many offerings did we study on Friday of last week? Amen? But when Jesus Christ came, he went to Calvary once for all. He did the peace offering, the burnt offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the peace offering. He did all of the offerings in one. He didn't need to be a goat and a bull and a turtle dove and sheaves of corn and baked breads. No, he's all of it in one. So when you come to the revelation of Jesus Christ, when John sees it now in the book of Revelation, he sees one. In the midst of the golden candlesticks. But he does say he was to look upon as jasper and sardius stone. That's the first of the tribes and the last of the tribes. Now you'll notice how he's connecting that back with the old Israel church.
Because in that seven golden candlesticks, the real one in the middle of that, the oil, that which was their anointing for their season, is the jasper and sardius stone. He is the beginning and the ending. He is the first and the last. It's a beautiful principle when you start looking at it like that because we, we see then that the relevance of Israel is only really revealed when you come to Revelations 1. Where he stands there now, one like the Son of Man, to look upon as the jasper and sardius stone. Why? Because who is this? This is the root and the offspring of David. Amen. The son of Jesse. This is him. This is him who has come now into his church. But he's never disconnected from that which was in the Old Testament type. Let me just take it a little further here. He says, the jasper and the sardius stone, the beginning and the ending, Reuben and Benjamin. Uh, I, I can just take you, if you will, so it's not just my words. And if you want the message, it's the message seal of God, preached almost the same time as that message on the seven church ages we referred to earlier. Brother Branham says this, the, the first night before last was the church and the church age, how that we've seen Jesus standing in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He says, to look upon as jasper and sardius stone, the beginning and the ending, Reuben and Benjamin. See? Amen. So now you start seeing them in the candlesticks. Hopefully we will find a place where we find ourselves in the table of shoe bread. Because all of those in the tabernacle at one stage was referring to God and His relationship with Israel. But when you come to the New Testament, He says, you are the temple. And what is that? It's God in relationship with the New Testament church, which is His bride. Which is just so much one with Him as what they were in symbolic in the Old Testament. Now, you see, he says, I'm the beginning and the ending. The first, the last. Reuben and Benjamin. Firstborn, lastborn. Well, watch what he's doing. This is this one now who's standing in the midst of the candlesticks. I'm, I'm the one that starts. I'm the one that ends. When we read Revelation, we see it's Moses and it's Elijah. Now you watch what started the dispensation of the law. Moses. Moses was a prophet that started something. When you come to the end of the law, you find one with the spirit of Elijah, John the Baptist, that ends that dispensation. There's a beautiful thing, and I don't know if we can give it justice, but let me just touch on it a little bit tonight, this morning. <clears throat> if we see this in the light of Moses and Elijah, Moses' ministry was a ministry of deliverance. A ministry that started something, that started a coming out, uh, a liberating ministry. But notice, Elijah didn't take them out of anywhere. He restored what Moses preached. When Elijah came on the scene, he didn't say, well, Lord, give me a revelation of who you are so I can tell the people. The revelation was already written by Moses. On the mount, God spoke to him, I am the Lord your God. You will have no other gods before me. Amen. There, there was no question for Elijah to answer. Because that prophet that started that dispensation had already spoken the word. So Elijah in his day, standing before, as we saw in our day, uh, uh, Ahab and a Jezebel, we've seen the modern type of that in this hour. Elijah stood before Ahab, and what did he say? He could say, I preached what Paul preached. I preached what Moses preached. I'm not preaching another God. I'm not preaching another law. I'm not preaching another message. I'm just here to take that which he preached and that God and to make him alive before your eyes. So you'll notice by the one kind of ministry, God puts things out before the people for them to believe, followed with great supernatural 
But as time goes along, they slip away and God has to bring the other part of the ministry, the Moses and Elijah by type, to bring back to remembrance the things that were spoken by the initiating prophet. Moses was seen as the lawgiver. He was a writing prophet. Amen. Wrote the first five books of the Bible. Amen. When you look at the New Testament, you find another writing prophet. You find Paul. He was a prophet. Amen. And what did he do? He initiated the work for the New Testament church. Started to write it in epistles and things that now we have as the cherished word of God. He was beginning a dispensation. But just like you find this starting out, there had to come something at the end that would connect back again with the beginning because it's Jasper and Sardius. It's beginning and ending. It's all there in the church ages. So when you come to the end, it's got to connect back to the first. So the ministry at the end could not be another Paul. But it had to be a ministry like the ministry of Elijah that would turn the hearts back to the original. Remember, there's two like that in Scripture. John the Baptist, in his day, when he preached repentance, he's turning hearts. Where is he turning them to? Back to where it started. Back to the law of Moses. Back to repentance to the true word that they had. Turning hearts. When you come to the last prophet God sends upon the earth, he's there to turn hearts back to the original. Back to the first. Amen. So Elijah preached what Moses preached. Amen. And so we see one in the spirit of Elijah, John, comes and actually ends the Old Testament dispensation. And there you have your two witnesses. God will start a ministry. He will give them the word. He'll start a dispensation with an outpouring of His Spirit, a demonstration of His power. When He comes right to the end, He's bringing it right back to their remembrance by a prophet that's anointed to turn their thoughts and their hearts back to the original word that was spoken. I thank God for the ministry we had in our day. There you see the principle of the two olive trees. But now in the Son of Man, He is fulfilling the first and the last all within Himself. And through His church, He is performing the purpose for which this is all being set up. I want to try and draw to a close for this morning. But I want to just say this. Look now, as we looked at this candlestick, and here you see these two olive trees feeding it, the oil coming in. And, and in my mind's eye, I can just see how that, that perfect, pure oil, uh, the Lord in some way you know, miraculously lets it come through the fruits of the olives and just drip down in something that feeds it in into the pipes and down, up it goes through the channels right up to the burning lamps. And, and there it fulfills its purpose. Because what is the purpose of the oil? You see, he says, these are the two anointed sons. What is the point of this anointing? What is it to do? The purpose of the oil and its whole supply mechanism, as it is described in the scripture, is that the church can shine forth the supernatural light. You say, what are you saying, brother, supernatural light? Well, you know what? Even when they had a symbolic oil, which was olive oil, it was the same olive oil that somebody else would find from olives. The fire was different. Because God, by His own power, by His own being, the source of fire, He ignited the first lamp. Brother Bram actually refers to this and shows how that the sons of Aaron brought strange fire before the Lord. Now you remember that uh, the Lord had never commanded them to bring incense. 
He had never commanded them to do what they were doing. They got into a spiritual moment there. Things were going, things were happening. The anointing of God was there. Fire fell from the presence of God. And then they brought something. But you know what? They brought their own fire. The Lord calls it strange fire. If we had to put that in modern terms, false anointing. False anointing. It's still an anointing. There's still something burning, but it's false. Because it wasn't lit from the first. You see, and, and, and I don't understand why the Christian world can't grasp this principle that you have to connect back with the original. You've got to bring everything back to the Word. You know, people just want to get this idea, well, you know, well, God loves us and God doesn't want us to die and, and He just, we're going to make it. Ah. You bring false fire, strange fire. You bring that before the Lord, you die. It may look just the same. Realize this, it may look just the same. But it does not come from the same source. And because it doesn't come from the same source, God distinguishes it from that which is right and that which is strange. And by that it's referring to the foreign. But what is it? The church was lit in the beginning at Ephesus. Not by man. Man was just sitting in the upper room waiting. Just waiting. Waiting for God to light the first candle. To write the first lamp. Amen. And what did he do? He brought the oil and he brought the fire and connected that together within the tree to make that person a burning bush licks a fire and, and anybody who stood around started saying what's this strange thing going on it drew the attention of the people the same way because something was taking place what was it? God lit supernaturally the first lamp and Brother Bram painstakingly goes through it. He says they, they had to take those cups with the lamps. They couldn't take the one and light this and light that and light that and light that and light that. It didn't work like that. No, you had to take the first one that God lit. Then you had to light the next one. Then you put that down. Then you had to take that one and move it to the next one. Light that and put it down. Take it. Why? Because it had to go from one to the next to the next. To show the progression of the same fire spreading systematically right through the ages. But what did they do? As the next one got lit, this one got all denominated. All full of pitch and you know what it happens with your wicks you get all this carbon build up and the lamp gets dimmer and dimmer and it dies but God's already burning in another age in another age and another age and it goes and it goes and so they denominate they die they die they die they die and through the ages all of those had gone and fell asleep until you come to the last age amen and it's still the same anointing that fell in the beginning. But now, it is not just an Elijah, but it's an Elisha anointing. It's in, in increased capacity. The whole Holy Spirit visits the church in the end time. To do what? Not only to make sure that this fire never can go out, but what's he doing? From that, he's calling back in a resurrection all those who have gone on before. In the same process, in the same principle. And this faith that comes here now, this understanding by the revelation is there and brings up the whole church so that we can meet Him in the Lord. Now, this oil, what is it for? It is so that the church can be the witness, can show the light in the age in which it is. Why is that lamp burning? It is to give off the light. Amen. And it needs to draw on the oil to keep doing it. A lot of people think, well, you know, I had an experience one time and, and that's good enough. No, there's got to be a constant connection with the source. 
There's got to be a, this is what the olive trees tells you right back to the word where the water in the soil is being drawn up and becomes anointed all the way through to the final product of the life. It's got to connect you through. If you disconnect, it dies. If we have time, you could look at, at Joel. Maybe we'll do that this afternoon a little bit. But in Joel's age, the scripture speaks about the tree dying off. Why? If you cut off things that feed up, you don't have the product at the end. If you disconnect with the word, you're not going to have the anointing. If you disconnect with the pipes, you're not going to have the anointing. If you disconnect with God's way of conveying that anointing through from the Word into the lamp, you're going to be without the product at the end. No light. It's going to go out. It's going to die off. Amen. But I thank God this hour we stand in the season where we realize that that one who's in our midst, that one like unto the Son of Man, that one who is really the, the fullness of the church, is there proclaiming our victory and sh shining forth upon us and, and speaking to us and saying, Arise, shine. Time to let your light go. It's here. It's the season. It's the rising of the sun. It's dark out there. Gross darkness upon the people. But you shall arise with, with light. Amen. With an anointing. My. To do what? To shine that light. And you know what's so beautiful? I just love this. Uh, and I want to say it. The contagious nature of the fire. Have you ever noticed if you bring the fire close to something else that's combustible, it will make it burn as well. Isn't that beautiful? So the church is really on a commission to be like that lamp that just goes to the next combustible thing. Your own personal life. If you're really anointed with the Holy Spirit, what are you going to do? You're going to light somebody else. You're going to light somebody else because the fire that's burning on you will make that which is of the same material catch a light. Amen. And I believe that is the true revival of the church. Is when the church is so one burning mass to the glory of God. Like it was on the day of Pentecost. That lick of fire upon every one of them. That same Holy Spirit now manifesting in His church. Thank God. Oh my, I just think this is a time to let it shine forth. And let God just do something in our midst. We see these symbols but what's it trying to tell you? You are that lamp. You are drawing on that Holy Spirit. You are connected with the source. I'm so glad about that. Amen. Hallelujah. He redeemed me. Let's sing that chorus this morning. I've been born again to win. That really says that there has been an, an anointing upon the seed that is in my life to bring forth a fire that there's a dynamic. There's something that's lived out. Let's stand to our feet. <coughs> I've been born again again yes Lord I thank God I thank God mm -hmm. oh of his fullness have we all received hallelujah hallelujah creation I'm a brand new man thank you Lord all things are passed away born again. Thank you, Lord. More than a conqueror. That's what I am. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Just hold it there for me for a minute. As you sing that, I want you to realize this this morning. 
that you're connected into the pipe work you're connected into the source that feeds this into your being as the church of the living God we're not some isolated something that's put off somewhere we're connected in right into the very roots of what gives the anointing right to the very roots of what brings forth the light we're not able to be separated from it because he's brought us from one piece one piece connected amen i'm a new creation I'm so glad I'm a part of this family of God. Aren't you glad about that this morning? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood, joined heirs with Jesus as we travel this part of the family the family of God oh I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God I've been washed in that fountain thank you Lord cleansed by his blood join cares with Jesus as we travel this I'm a part of the family, that family of God. I'm a part, I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood, joined heirs with Jesus as we travel the star. Amen. Burn on, burn on. Oh, fire of God, burn on. Till all my dross is burnt away. And, and you know, the more it burns, it gets rid of your dross, but it also shines a light to others. May God really let us fulfill that purpose. All this difficult work, all this intricate design, all the things that God has put into it, it's for a purpose that there may be light in the evening time. Amen. Burn on, burn on. Yes. Oh yes. We raise our hands to you, Lord. We say, fire of God. That original that lit the first lamp. Let it burn on, Lord. Till all our cross, all our worldliness. Oh God, may it all just be burnt away. Prepare us for a final testing day, oh God. Oh, fire of God. Fire of God. Burn on. Oh, burn on. Yes, Lord. Let it burn. Let your Holy Spirit work in our lives like never before, Lord. Burn away all self, all of man's desire, all the things that we give priority over in you, Lord. Let it just get away, Lord, and burn it up. Oh, yes. May you just take us and make us what you want us to be, Lord. Fire of God. 
And I believe He will do that. And He will accomplish what He has said He will. Amen. By God's grace, there is a light shining in this hour where the world is in gross darkness. And where is it? You find where that witness is feeding the light. It's there. I believe we're drawing from that same source in this end time that started the fire in the beginning. That same pure anointing oil, the true Holy Spirit working and manifesting in the lives of individuals. Isn't he a wonderful Savior this morning? I'm so glad we have a God like our God. You know, when we start looking at these things, you study the scriptures, you look through these things, you find everything just dovetails together. It just makes my heart just anchor deeper and deeper and deeper in this word. There's just no other way. God has brought us to see this and to live it, to experience it. Isn't that a privilege? Amen. May we go on our way rejoicing. As we said this afternoon at four o'clock, We'll be back here just to, to continue with some of these thoughts by God's grace. And if you can be with us, um, we'll be here and just enjoy this fellowship. It's just been, to me, a great privilege that we've had over these two weekends to be able to come and just surrender ourselves before the Lord and just to have Him have His will and His purpose amongst us this morning. We appreciate that. Amen. Brother Christian, will you come and just dismiss us in a word of prayer this morning? Let us bow our heads. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Eternal Heavenly Father, we truly thank you, O God, for your loving grace. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the time that we spend in your presence, O God. Lord Jesus, we know that you are the truth, you are the life, and you are all that we need. Precious Lord, it doesn't take a preaching of two hours, O God, for you to save a life, but it takes only one word from you, O God. Lord, we truly appreciate your holy way that came forth this morning. Lord, just getting to the point of realizing that, Lord, we, we are not saved by our works, oh God. We, we are not just a different pieces that come from different places, oh Lord, but just knowing that, Lord, we, we, we came from one source, oh God, and all that we are and all that we have, oh God, and all that make us stand, Lord, come from you, oh Lord. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We, we truly appreciate, oh God, your word. Lord Jesus, we, we cherish your, your only name, Lord, because, Lord Jesus, by you and through you, oh God, we can stand. May you bless this morning, brother. You don't understand, oh God, in the gap, oh God, you brought forth your word. Lord Jesus, may you, Lord, just unveil yourself more and more to him, oh God, in the way that when you stand again next time, oh Father, let, oh, oh Lord, whatever that you say, oh God, be a blessing to your people. We thank you, oh God. And now, Lord, we bless your holy name and say you want to depart, oh God, from this place. Lord, may you just be with us, oh God, and bring us back again for the evening service, oh God, as we pray in your precious name, dear Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 God bless you richly and be with you. Amen. So glad I'm yours, Lord. So glad I'm yours. So glad your mercy has followed me.